Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is Paul Shapiro, CEO and co-founder of the Better Meat Co., and author of the book Clean Meat, which chronicles the growth of the alternative meat industry. Paul's doing some very cool things like brewing proteins to make foods that replicate or enhance the meat experience and to make completely new kinds of foods. The side effect of his innovation is that it could spare real animals the ordeal of ending up on our dinner table and also spare the environment the burden of growing them for mass consumption. Paul, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. The delight is all mine, Vasant. Great to be with you. Well, you know, you'll get a kick out of this. I took my animal to Washington Square Park for a walk a couple of hours ago, and I was just sitting on the bench, beautiful day. You know, and this girl walks by and she says, oh, do you mind if I pet your dog? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know, and she starts petting the dog. And, you know, I asked her if she's a student at NYU. And she said, yeah, and she's doing blah, 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 and, and social stuff and, you know, alternative foods. And I said, really? Like, you know, I've got a podcast I'm recording in a couple of hours with, you know, the author of Clean Meat. And she says, I've read that book. And I was like, you know, small world. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Hopefully the book is sold enough that it's not that small world. But that's cool that uh, that this person read Clean Meat. I'm honored that she read it. And I hope that she really liked it. Yeah, she did. She did indeed. We talked about that. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where'd you grow up? You know, where'd you read? You know, what sort of rock and roll bands did you listen to? You know, what what influenced you uh, growing up? I, I like Vasant that you say, did I listen to as if I don't uh, still listen to them. But uh, so uh, <laughs> in, in short, I grew up in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. And <clears throat> uh, for me, like growing up, I always had dogs. Uh, my mom uh, worked at our local animal shelter and so we always had these adopted dogs in our house and it had a big influence on me. I believed that these dogs were like, you know, my family members, right? Like they weren't just pieces of property. Like to me, these were like almost like my brothers and sisters. In fact, I probably loved some of them more than my biological family members at some points uh, who, you know, my family is great, but, you know, I really love these dogs growing up. And I eventually came to think, you know, if I love these dogs and didn't want any harm to befall them, I, I shouldn't want harm to befall any animal. And that led me down a pathway of getting more and more interested in uh, plant-based eating and animal welfare and animal advocacy, which we can talk all about if you'd like. But I do want to make sure I don't evade your main question here because uh, I grew up uh, listening to a lot of like punk and hardcore music. And in fact, uh, back in like 94 and 95, I was the singer of a hardcore band. And so, oh, wow. and so we put out an album. So, you know, I was in high school, of course. I think I was, I think I was either a freshman or, yeah, I think I was a freshman in high school. But we put out an album and we, uh, we played a bunch of shows. Uh, but, you know, uh, needless to say, we were never uh, that popular. Uh, so um, so my, my career as a, as a musician uh, was extremely brief. Um, but I still listen to that kind of music from time to time today, although uh, now I am married to a Mexican-American woman, and that has led me to listen to like a lot of Latin pop. And so uh, I'm, I, I'm more likely to be listening to J-Lo than I am to hardcore or punk these days, honestly. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I, I, I grew up uh, playing in the rock and roll band in college myself. Oh, ah, nice. Sort of do, yeah, we do sort of gigs um, in town. I missed many of my 8 o'clock classes. <laughs> what, did, did you, what did you play in the band? Well, you know, I uh, started playing flute. We used to do a lot of Jethro Tull. Oh, cool. Uh, and then the drummer left, so I started playing the drums. Uh, but, you know, we used to play a lot of sort of straight 60s, 70s rock and roll. Like know, Rolling Stones. Bob, Se Bob, Bob Seger? Thing. No, no, not, not Bob Seger. This is, I guess, I wasn't that familiar with Bob Seger. It was, you know, it was 
there were other bands that had much more of an influence in my life, like the Beatles and oh, okay. Stones and the Who and Tull and you know Grand Funk, you know, cool. you know and uh, yeah, those kinds of bands, sort of Led, Led Zeppelin. And do you still listen sort of, today to those same bands? I do, I do. You know, I evolved towards blues a lot, and then uh, a lot of sort of Rasta music at some point. You know, nice. it's just sort of various phases. But uh, yeah, yeah it's, have, uh, it, it's interesting because we're so influenced by what we listen to as young people. Like we continue listening to the same stuff. And I wondered, like, you know, does this mean when you have on-demand music that it harms, like, new artists? Because you're not listening to the radio with new stuff. You're just listening to the stuff that you want. And it turns out that, I don't remember the exact number, but it was some surprisingly large number of Spotify, uh, of Spotify streams are old music. Like, it's, like, the new stuff is a very small portion of what is on there. Now, of course, when Taylor Swift releases an album, that changes things. Um, but... Uh, I, I don't know what the numbers were, but it was something that surprised me by a very large amount of the music that's listened to on Spotify is not new music. You know, it's funny you talk about Spotify. I Last night, I, I texted a, a colleague of mine because uh, I was listening to Spotify and, you know, he and one of his students have been doing a lot of work with uh, Spotify's recommender systems. And I, you know, I felt like listening to like a Tom Petty song. So I turned that on loud. I was by myself. And it played 15 of my favorite songs yeah. after that, you know, from the Allman Brothers, nice. um, you know, Stones, uh, you know, just like it was just one after the other. And I've never had a streak that long. So, wow. you know, it's amazing, something right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never understood when people complain about this. Like, oh, I don't like that the algorithm is trying to predict me. It's like, didn't, don't you want things that you are more likely to like? Like on, on Netflix, if I'm suggested something that I actually want to see, I consider that a benefit as opposed to being suggested something I have no interest in. So I actually like the idea of having these AIs at like Amazon and Netflix and Spotify trying to predict what I like because you know, a lot of the times they're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Paul, let's talk about, you know, stuff you're doing. And, you know, the path that sort of brought me to you was, you know, I recorded an episode with, you know, animal rights activist Menika Gandhi. And in preparation for that, I read Peter Singer's Animal, animal Liberation, um, and it made me give up meat. It was just like, oh, yeah, I can't ignore this. Hey, that's um, great. That's not good you know, for you. Yeah, I was sort of hardcore uh, carnivore before that. You know, my cuisine, I'm from Kashmir, is very, you know, meat-based. But that was just, uh, you know, I, it was just too much. And I noticed by the way, reading your book that you mentioned um, another gentleman, Arturo Elizondo, who also read the book and it had a similar impact on him. So I think Peter, unknow, you know, without his knowledge, has, has had a big impact on, on people who read that book. You know, so I spoke to Menica about animal rights, you know, her approach is more, you know, to get people to see the harmful aspects of the meat industry and how it's impacting the environment, health, all that kind of stuff. But you've taken a, a different approach, um, you know, so your approach is to put animals in their misery by making them irrelevant. So tell us a little bit more about this thinking of yours and what led you down this path. Uh, sure. So essentially 30 years of animal advocacy and my own evolution as an animal advocate led me down this path. I am a huge fan of Maneka and her work, and I am grateful to everyone who is trying to persuade our species to treat animals with more kindness. That, I think, is wonderful. I, too, read Peter Singer's book. It also had a very major impact on my thinking. Um, sadly, uh, you know, the history is not littered with examples of when people have decided to treat animals better and ended our exploitation of them. So if you think about why it is that we've stopped many of the major forms of animal exploitation that we've stopped, almost always it's because a new technology is invented. Just think about it. For thousands of years, we whipped horses to persuade them to transport us and our products. Nobody stopped using horses because they cared about the horses, they stopped because cars were invented. For a long time, we harpooned whales in order to light our homes. 
Nobody stopped harpooning whales because they cared about whales. They stopped because kerosene was invented and we had a cleaner, more efficient way to light our homes. Similarly, we used to tear uh, feathers out of live geese, a very inhumane practice so we could have quills to write with. Nobody stopped using quill pens because they cared about geese. They stopped because metal fountain pens were invented. And the list goes on and on and on, where technologies have rendered obsolete the exploitation of animals, whereas humane sentiment has pretty much never rendered a whole category of animal exploitation obsolete. Um, And so I spent a very large part of my career working in the animal welfare nonprofit space, working to get animals better treatment. I think that's wonderful. I salute to the people who are doing it. At the same time, while we are trying to get the animals we know will be used for food in this case, better living conditions, we also have to be working on creating alternatives that'll render their exploitation a relic of an archaic past. And so that's why I wrote the book Clean Meat, because it is an exploration and a chronicling of the scientists, the entrepreneurs, the investors who are all racing to bring to the world slaughter-free meat. And I believe that there are lots of different ways to recreate the meat experience. Think about it like with energy. There's lots of ways to recreate energy without fossil fuels, wind, solar, geothermal, etc. But there are lots of ways to recreate meat without animals also. You can use plant proteins, you can cultivate animal cells, you can do microbial fungi fermentation. There's lots of ways to do it. And so the question then becomes, what is going to be more likely to help animals? Uh, trying to persuade industries that have heavy economic incentives not to improve their treatment, or just creating products that are going to outcompete those industries on taste and on price. Now, the industry is not doing that yet. They're not the plant-based meat industry isn't yet competing on 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 uh, price, and to the most for the most part, it still has a long way to go on taste in some cases. Uh, but that's what I think it's going to take in order to, uh, due to the factory farming of animals, what was done to the whaling industry and the horse-drawn carriage industry and so on. So why aren't plant-based alternatives competing on taste yet? You know, I had meatballs, quote-unquote meatballs the other day. Uh, they tasted like the real thing. That's great. Uh, you know, I've had the Impossible Burger, you know. You know, tasted like the real thing. Not that I'm craving the real thing. In fact, I've developed a bit of an aversion, frankly. But I was just curious yeah. you know, to, to flesh. It doesn't yeah, uh, it, make me, you know, give me a warm fuzzy feeling. But it was pretty darn good. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Vasant, because what I've found is that for people who still eat meat, they really like the meat alternatives. For people who are new to vegetarian eating, they like them. But for people who've been vegetarian for some time, they do seem to, in, in my own anecdotal experiences of the world, they do seem to lose some of that taste for meat and that they're happier to eat things like lentil soup or hummus wraps or a masala dosa or whatever the case may be. And so... Um, I am a firm believer that we have to give people what they want to eat with a much lower footprint on the planet and animals. Um, But it is clear to me that, you know, the more time you spend away from meat, the less you do seem to crave it. Now, in terms of the taste issue, I think you're right, Vasant. I think that in recent years, plant-based meats have gotten dramatically better. However, in blind taste tests with people in focus groups, they typically still can tell the difference. And the goal here is to have something that at a minimum you can't tell the difference with or is actually better. And so, for example, if, um, if metal fountain pens, which displaced quill pens, were just an alternative to quills, but they weren't actually better, you wouldn't have seen rapid displacement of quill pens in the way that you did. But a metal metal fountain pen is dramatically better. You know, you don't have to stop and dip the quill into an inkwell. You don't have to constantly sharpen the quill tip. Like a metal fountain pen lets you write uninterrupted. And so everybody wanted to switch to them. Similarly, it's obvious why a car would be better than a horse for so many reasons. And so I think the task before us today has to be to find ways to allow ourselves to continue to enjoy the meat experience without animals, but in a way that not just mimics meat, but is even better. It could be better on taste. It could be better on price. Whatever it's going to be, I think in order to truly outcompete it, it needs to be better. Similarly, you want to make sure that renewable energy is cheaper than conventional fossil fuel-based energy. And until that happens on a regular basis, you're not going to see widespread transition. So uh, I don't think it's enough just to mimic it. I think it needs to be better.
Thanks for that crisp summary of the space, Paul, and the challenge, that of being better. Say more about the three approaches to meet that you uh, touched on earlier and your approach specifically. Well, like I mentioned, Vasant, most of the activity here is on plant-based meat. And that means taking plants and turning them into things that look like animals, right? Or that taste like animals. So you're taking soy or wheat or pea. There's pretty much like 99% of plant-based meat is made off of soy protein, wheat protein, or pea protein, or some combination thereof. Um, you do have some up-and-coming ingredients like fava beans and chickpeas and so on. But for the most part, you're talking about soy, pea, and wheat. And these are great. They're awesome foods, but there are some limitations, mainly because plants and animals are very far away from each other on the tree of life. So you've got to do a lot to plants to get them to end up looking and tasting like animal meat. So there's a lot of processing steps. Um, so some companies are ditching plant proteins altogether and just going to actual animal cell cultivation. This is sometimes referred to as cultivated meat or queen meat, but it's growing actual animal cells to make animal meat without the animals. This is a really promising technology too, but the problem is that it is still years away from being on fast food menus and big box grocery store shelves, which is of course the type of scale that is necessary to make the dent in the problem that we are trying to solve here. But there is a third way. And that third way is the F word, fungi, of course. And so their fantastic world of fungi offers a really unique way to recreate the meat experience with a whole food nutritional product. So for example, if you think, of, go, go back to like your grade school biology class, you remember that there are multiple kingdoms of life, plants and animals, but there's also the fantastic world of fungi. And fungi, interestingly enough, are way more closely related to animals than either are to plants. And so for centuries, people have been using mushrooms as a meat replacer because mushrooms tend to have a more meat-like texture than plants do. But here, I'm not talking about mushrooms. I'm talking about mycelium or the root-like structure that uh, is underneath the mushroom. And so what my company, The Better Meat Code, does is take microscopic fungi and we subject it to a special kind of fermentation where within mere hours, we transform microbes into a whole food, meat textured product that on its own, not only has the texture of meat, but is packed with protein, iron, zinc, and other nutri nutrients that you typically associate with meat that are now part of this fungi. So what we at The Better Meat Code do is essentially run a microbial fermentation that allows us to produce a food that sure tastes a lot like meat and has the nutritional uh, impact that you want that many people associate with meat, but with a dramatically lower footprint on the planet and animals. So to put this in perspective, it takes a cow more than a year of feeding before you get a steak. In our case, we can harvest our microbial fungi in less than one single day. So from the moment we inoculate our fermenter to the moment we harvest our fermenter is less than one day, making it among the most efficient ways to produce protein on a planet that is everly increasingly hungry. So I believe that microbial fungi fermentation can not only help liberate humanity from our reliance on animal slaughter, but I think it can uh, really create all types of novel culinary experiences that we've never before enjoyed. And we can talk about that more, but this is how I come to think that microbial fungi fermentation can actually be better than meat, not just identical to meat today, but actually be better. Very cool. Mushrooms are quite versatile indeed. And the food you're talking about sounds incredibly nutritious to boot. So why aren't we seeing more consumption of this stuff? It's largely not on the market yet. There's only so many foods that are made via microbial fermentation that are out there. Uh, so one of them is a product that's called corn, Q-U-O-R-N. And this is a product that's been around for decades. It's mainly in the Europe. It's, it is in the U.S. a little, but mainly in Europe. And it's primarily marketed to vegetarians, not to meat consumers. And really, we, we need these foods to be eaten by meat consumers, since that's how you actually have impact. So uh, that's one example of a product that is made from this. And corn sells hundreds of millions of dollars of products every year. Uh, they have partnerships with KFC and other uh, fast food restaurants in the UK, for example. Um, but the capital expenditures needed to produce this type of product are pretty substantial. Um, you're not growing things in a field, you need to grow them inside of fermentation tanks. And so 
you end up creating something that looks like a beer brewery, except instead of brewing alcohol, you are brewing protein. And that is the difference. And so that's a lot of stainless steel. So while the operating costs may not be as big, the capital expenditures are. And so it's a barrier for entry to a lot of companies that don't have access to the type of capital needed to create commercial fermentation operations to create these types of mycoproteins. I see. I actually thought it was a question of sort of perception and, and demand for it as opposed to a problem on the supply side. No, I don't think that I don't think that's true. Um, I think if foods taste good and they're they're deemed by authorities to be safe and they are cost effective, people will eat them. Paul, to what extent is the nomenclature in this alternative space or the lack of a good nomenclature in, in this alternative space a barrier to its adoption? And the lack of a good story. I mean, in your book, you refer to the fact that people couldn't figure out what to call the various alternatives, like mock meat or artificial meat. You know, neither of it sound particularly uh, attractive. I would bet if supermarkets call their two meats plant-based meat and slaughtered meat, that might change consumption patterns. I very much agree with you, Vasant. I, I do think that if people refer to it as slaughter-based meat, that people would have a very different perspective. There's a uh, movement afoot right now, actually, to start uh, calling, instead of calling it natural gas, to calling it fossil gas, uh, because people, and, and so even in you know places like Los Angeles, they've banned the installation of new uh, gas stoves, as an example. If you want to build a house or apartment building, you can't even put a gas stove in there anymore. So uh, that, that type of nomenclature change, I do think, makes a big difference. And there's also a similar example on this that is more to the point of what you're referring to in Europe, when they passed regulations requiring that uh, eggs coming from birds who are confined in cages had to say on the carton, eggs from caged hens, demand for caged eggs dropped. And so just by telling people, you know, these are eggs from caged hens, you, you did see demand drop. And so, you know, I think that it is, it's a fact that technology has changed so much about how we live here on earth. So instead of whipping horses, we now use bikes and cars. Instead of harpooning whales, we now use electricity. And instead of live plucking geese, we now tap on glass screens to send messages, right? Um, but it always seems odd to us at first. These new technologies always seem odd. So recall that what we now know as cars once were referred to at the beginning as horseless carriages. That's what we called them. But eventually, we come to recognize the superiority of these new technologies and we switch to them en masse. And we hardly remember what life was like prior to the new invention. And I think that microbial fungi fermentation is just one way to help liberate humanity from our reliance on animal slaughter, but it is a critically, and it is a critically important scalable solution. It's scalable today. And it's, it's such a vexing problem as to how we are going to sustainably feed ourselves into the 21st century, but we only have one planet and we shouldn't deforest the rest of it simply so that we can eat more and more animals. And instead, just as we have to end our reliance on fossil fuels, we also have to end our reliance on factory farms. And today, you know, the only place you're going to find a harpoon is in a, a museum. Well, I think the time has come for us to leave the factory farming of animals where it too belongs, which is in our past. And the way to do that is by advancing these types of technologies like microbial fermentation, cultivation of animal cells, and plant-based proteins. These are the pathways for us to be able to actually achieve that goal. Talking about what we call things, tell us about the story of the California rolls, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. So yeah, just for listeners who aren't familiar with the California roll story is that you know, it, it may be apocryphal, um, but the story goes as following. Uh, when, you know, in the 1970s, Americans were not accustomed to eating sushi. They certainly were not accustomed to eating raw fish. And as a result, uh, you had a, a real aversion to consuming any sushi, having sushi become popular. And so what one entrepreneurial chef decided to do was essentially turn the roll inside out. So the, fit, the raw fish was not on the outside, but rather now is on the inside in like a bed of rice that people were accustomed to eating. And instead of having a name, uh, you know, like agadashi or something that was way more Japanese, they called it the California roll. And they put something that Californians love in there, avocados. So now you had fish, avocado, and, and the rice. And 
the avocado roll or the California roll was born and it was a way to ease people in to enjoying sushi. And now, of course, there are sushi restaurants in every city in America, basically. So the question is, like, is, is that something that we need in this particular case? Do we need our own California roll for alternative meats? And uh, I don't know what that would be, but I would love to try it, whatever that is. Whoever, whatever uh, marketing genius comes up with the next California roll, I'd like to be able to, be, to try it. Yeah, I thought that was a great story. You know, it was, it was sort of the gateway food to yeah. sushi becoming po so popular, right? That's kind of, you know, I, I had no idea that that's how sushi became so popular. Because I remember, you know, biting into raw fish the first time. And it just, there was a, you know, it, it, it took a lot. You know, I just wasn't used to the concept. Yeah. And now it's just routine, right? So we can get used <laughs> to things so quickly. Yeah, for um, sure. And, you know, another a good example of this, frankly, is cheese. So think about it like, you know, after humanity domesticated cows, people were drinking milk. But it wasn't until much later that people learned how to curdle milk. And so they didn't know anything about Gouda or Brie or Swiss or cheddar. Like cheese was a completely novel food to our species. And now... Everybody eats cheese, and not everybody, but lots of people eat cheese. In fact, most people in America, yeah, they are eating it every single day and they love it, even though it's a food that is like really a product of this new technology, curdling, that we only discovered in the pretty recent past, like only single digit thousands of years ago. Uh, so, you know, this is a good example of how an entirely new category of food altogether was invented that now is a staple of many people's diets, but a blink of an eye ago, historically speaking, zero humans had ever consumed it. Yeah, you know, I mean, and talking about technology, by the way, Paul, I, I noticed that the word CRISPR was conspicuously absent from your book, right? It, it shouldn't um, be. Yeah, shame on me. So there is, um, you know, I'm glad you raised this, Vasant. So Queen Meat was published in 2018, and there is going to be a new edition. Um, I'm very proud to say the book has sold quite well, and there's going to be a paperback edition coming out uh, in another year or so. And so I am working on that now, and I, I promise you that I will rectify the injustice that you have uh, that you've diagnosed here. <laughs> so let's uh, so let's uh, press on that a little bit more because I think it's related to sort of this gateway product. For some reason, gateway reminds me of gateway drugs, but. What, so what's what's the gateway going to be? Is you know I, I think you argue that it might be leather instead of meat, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where a lot of this genetic engineering might come in. So say more about that. Well, it seems pretty clear to me that people don't really have any objection to technology in their clothing. Some people are concerned about technology in their food. But nobody is concerned, like nobody buys Gore-Tex and they're thinking, oh, what is this, right? Even though it's a completely new material to humanity, right? Like Gore-Tex did not exist for more than 99% of human history. And now people wear it and they really like it because it keeps them warm and dry, et cetera. And so the question is like, you know, if it's easier to make leather than meat, which seems true, would it be better to start out by having cultivated leather on the market? And I'm very proud to say that Clean Meat was the first and still only book that was ever produced with a lab-grown leather-bound book. So the very first, uh, the very first copy of Clean Meat was bound in lab-grown leather. It was grown by Geltor, a startup in this space, and uh, we auctioned it off. Uh, we sold it for thirteen thousand dollars. Um, all money, all the proceeds went to the Good Food Institute, which is a charity in the alternative protein space. And uh, so there's some lucky collector in the world right now who has the world's only lab-grown leather-bound book in there, in their home. And so, you know, I, I really think that there is a, a lot of promise in doing this uh, in creating leather without animals and that we can create really impressive products um, that uh, do a much better job for animals on the planet and that it may ease people into the idea of animal-free animal products if they are already wearing such leather, maybe they'll be willing to eat such beef as well. So how does it actually work, like the construction of synthetic leather? I think you talk about, you know, the... I guess building it from up bottom up from the collagen molecule. Right. Yeah, so collagen... It, 
So collagen is a very common protein in nature. Um, it's all over your body and it's over a cow's body and so on. And so you can uh, do it a couple ways. So you could either uh, use animal cell culture and just start growing animal skin. Um, but you can do it perhaps more easily by starting with the building blocks of collagen and persuade microbes to produce collagen. So as an example, think about like uh, if you take uh, baker's yeast and you feed it sugar, it produces CO2, and that's what gets your bread your bread to rise, right? So, you know, if you don't put baker's yeast in your dough, you're not going to get bread to rise. What keeps the bread rising is the CO2 that's excreted by the baker's yeast when it consumes sugar. That's why you have bubbles in the bread. That's what's coming from there. So the way that baker's yeast pretty much works is you feed it sugar, and it produces CO2, and it makes your bread rise. Similarly, if you take brewer's yeast, and you feed it sugar, uh, it produces alcohol, right? It eats the sugar and it excretes the alcohol. That's how you get beer and wine and so on. Well, in this case, though, what if you could uh, bioengineer a microbe like a baker's yeast or a brewer's yeast, but some other microbe, and instead of producing CO2 or producing alcohol, you're producing collagen, a protein. And that's not that technologically difficult to do today. This is, you know, we've been using microbes to produce proteins for decades now. This is how we produce all of the insulin that people who have diabetes inject into themselves today. This is uh, how we produce rennet for cheese. Um, so there's lo lots of examples of using microbi uh, microbial fermentation to create these types of uh, proteins or, or enzymes that uh, we want and that we favor. In this case, you can just produce collagen. The very collagen that makes up leather today, you can just produce it through microbial fermentation. So that's the best way to think about it. You feed the microbe sugar and it excretes collagen. And so like, how far have we come since you wrote the book on this technology? What's changed in the last three or four years? Um, an enormous amount has changed. The book, honestly, is still pretty evergreen because it's mainly about the the concepts and people in this industry. Um, at the same time, uh, there's been an explosion of companies that have been formed in the space. Massive amounts of capital have poured into the space. We were celebrating uh, four years ago if a company raised one or two million dollars. Now they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. And so there is a huge amount that has changed in the space in that time. Sadly, though, what hasn't changed is that you still see virtually no clean meat being sold anywhere in the world. So Singapore is the one exception where there is a uh, group uh, um, of restaurants that are serving on a limited basis, uh, chicken grown from cultivated chicken cells made by a company called Eat Just. And this is really cool, but it's it's pretty symbolic. I mean, it's, it's historically important, um, but it's not making a dent in total chicken consumption. And so that's really been the major change. So there've been other big advancements and people building demonstration scale plants and so on. But for the most part, um, you see a lot more money coming into the space, many more companies in the space, but no real progress yet made on actually starting to make a dent in the problem that this industry is seeking to solve. So have the barriers to entry gone up significantly in this space? I mean, if you're, a, if you're an innovator now, what's different today than four years ago with all of this money coming in? Uh, I don't think they've gone up. I think they've gone down. So now there's more of an ecosystem in place to sell you what you want. So instead of developing your own media, which is like the, a fancy way to say the feedstock that you're feeding your cells, you can buy that from companies in the space. And instead of designing your own bioreactors, those can be purchased uh, from companies that make bioreactors for this type of purpose. So uh, I think there's just a much more of an ecosystem in place to support the industry today than four years ago, but still it's extremely expensive. You know, these companies, even the most well-funded of them say that they're still producing uh, meat at well above the cost of animal-based meat or, or as the, the vasant term of slaughter-based meat. Uh, so, you know, we aren't, uh, we aren't at price parity yet, but getting in the right direction. So uh, that's really interesting. I hadn't actually thought about this whole ecosystem that you mentioned, right? What, what does the innovation space look like in terms of stages and where value is added? So, what, you know, so if you were to try and set up a, a, a business now in this space, and by the space, like, you know, choose, choose your space, right? Whether it's cellular or fermentation or uh, plant-based, who would be your suppliers and what would they be supplying you? Right? So I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of what sort of the innovation in this well, ecosystem looks like and innovation is happening. 
Sure. So there's, um, you know, if you think about like the gold rush, right? So the people who really did the best were the people who were selling picks and shovels, right? So, you know, not many people uh, made a lot of money on gold, but the people who were selling them the shovels did pretty well. Well, similarly, there's a lot of companies in this space that have been founded and many of them are not going to survive. But those that are supplying them with the tools they need to actually produce cultivated meat, those I do think are going to do a... um, uh, they have a, a good chance, right? So to answer your question, you have the actual infrastructure, which is the people selling the bioreactors. It's uh, all the other things you need. So boilers, chillers, um, air compressors, and so on. And then you have also the people who are selling you the consumables, mainly the feedstock for your cells. And your biggest cost is the feedstock. It's just like animal agriculture. What you feed your chickens is the most expensive part of the meat, right? So what you feed your cells is the most expensive part of your process. So it's really important to get that feedstock cost down. And now you have a lot of companies like Merck and others that actually have been focused on creating animal cell culture media that is much cheaper than the media that was being used four years ago, which was largely pharma pharma grade. You know, if you only need food grade, you don't want to be paying for pharma grade materials. So so would would these be things like non-animal based feedstocks and stuff like that? Is is that where the innovation is happening? Yeah, that's right. So it used to be the case that uh, these companies were reliant on certain animal-based feedstocks to keep their cells alive and happy and growing. Now they've largely moved away from that and they're using more synthetic media sources, um, but they still are not at price points that they want to be at. And so even though these are non-animal, they still have to get the cost way down. Paul, when did you set up your uh, company, just out of curiosity? I co-founded the Better Meat Co. in 2018. And so we've been around for about four and a half years now. We have a team of 24 people who are working here to create the next generation of animal-free protein ingredients. So I noticed that you've got these fermenters and tanks and all that kind of stuff. I saw a video where a bunch of people were tasting stuff and and, uh, commenting on that. What are the sort of relative costs of entry now uh, compared to like four years ago? Have they got, uh, you know, of this equipment, yeah. they, would, would it cost half as much, twice as much? Like, what, what are the economics like now? Well, there's, I, I would say, like, both inflation and demand has created a, a big problem. So you need stainless steel like that. You know, you're not going to run a fermentation facility without stainless steel. So that's a problem. Steel prices have gone way up. And then you think about how just the lead time, like the supply chain woes that have befallen the world as a result of the pandemic and and the war in in Ukraine and so on are uh, having an impact on us too. And so lead times for major pieces of equipment are very lengthy and you just have a lot of other problems. So it's, I would say it's just, it's a very difficult place to be in, honestly. If you think about the phase of innovation that we're in with this new technology in this industry, uh, perhaps in terms of an S-curve where there's an initial period of gestation, followed by rapid progress and eventually a flattening out, where are we in this industry? Or is that a silly question? I I don't think it's silly, but I do think it matters whether we're talking about plant-based meat, fungi-based meat, or animal cell cultivated meat. So, because those are all really three different technologies. At the same time, I think it's helpful to remember the very first time... So so, so actually, if I may interrupt, um, I I do want to sort of, I I want you to tell us about all those three, but sorry to interrupt, carry on. Okay. So the very first time that there's a recorded uh, record of a plant-based meat recipe is from more than a thousand years ago in ancient China, where they were making mock lamb and mock duck from things like soy and wheat. The very first time anybody patented a formula for making a plant-based meat was in 1899. That was John Harvey Kellogg of Kellogg's fame, who created his own um, nut-based plant-based meat and patented it. It wasn't, though, until the 1970s that you started seeing companies like Light Life in the 1980s, companies like Tofurky, taking this to new levels. And it wasn't until even like 2010 or so that you saw companies like Beyond and Impossible actually trying to really not just create foods that would satisfy vegetarians, but foods that would satisfy meat consumers, too. And so... I believe that you look at all these different generations of alternative meat that we've talked about today, and it's only been less than a decade that really convincing 
plant-based meat has been on the market. And so there's a long way to go. Like this industry is still less than 1% of the total volume of meat that is produced in the United States. So if you think about fluid milk right now, about 15% of fluid milk is, is um, plant-based, like almond milk, coconut milk, oat milk, soy milk, and so on. But less than 1%, less than 1% of meat is plant-based meat. And so there still is a very long way to go. And I believe that right now plant-based is, is, is doing pretty well, but it's got to come down in price. Uh, the inflation has really taken a big hit on this industry and you cannot continue to uh, have products that are priced at, you know, double or triple the cost of commodity meat. People are too price sensitive these days for that. So um, in terms of fungi-based meat, it's been on the market for decades, but only one brand. And so I think there's room for a big explosion of interest in, in that as well. And then in terms of animal cell culture, it's such early days, like it's not embryonic, but it is in its infancy. Um, I, I think the industry has been born but it's a very, very early stage infant. And it's still to be seen whether this industry will be able to grow into a, you know, a toddler or an adolescent. Uh, I'm rooting hard for it. I think that it'll require new technologies to be invented that'll make it possible. Um, but the people involved in this industry are, are quite smart and dedicated people. And I think that they're going to do a great job of bringing these products to market even if it's not going to be uh, scaling up to the way that it needs to for several more years. And there are some people, I think I, I forget who, but uh, you mentioned people in your book who think it's a crazy idea. Uh, yeah, there are many people who think that. There are many people who are very smart who think that, that animal cell culture will never work for this type of a purpose. Why is that? Um, their basic argument is that the cell densities that you can get to are not sufficient to ever make a product that is going to be cost competitive with slaughter-based meat. So I am not sure of that. Like, you know, can you cook cells to live a lot closer to one another? Probably so. I mean, if you think about uh, chickens, for example, it used to be that if you locked a bunch of chickens in a shed, they would all die. Um, but now we have figured out how to raise chickens by the tens of thousands. The problem is that chickens are sentient beings who don't do well in, in these environments, but we can keep them alive long enough so they can grow and be slaughtered. Fortunately, cells, unlike chickens, are not sentient. They're not conscious. And so if you can find ways to get more and more of them to live more comfortably closer and closer together, you could start betting that price curve. So the people who argue this isn't feasible are basically looking at the technologies that exist today and saying under what the technologies that we know exist today, it's not possible to do this at a price point that is anything worthy of marketing. I guess the other underlying assumption to that or underlying that technology is that people will not accept alternatives to the real thing. Yeah, I mean... Isn't, isn't that sort of one of the factors that's driving it? But by yeah. the way, I find that assumption highly questionable myself, you know, just given, you know, we I, talked about sushi, you know, yeah. people wouldn't, Americans never ate sushi, right? And yet we're consuming it, you know, uh, substantial amounts of it now. So I don't know, I, I find that assumption that people will not accept meat, you know, it's sort of, it, maybe we're stuck in a generational trap where maybe, maybe our, you know, our, our parents' generation wouldn't, but I think we'd probably be a little more open to it. Maybe the next generation will be fine with it. I to uh, yeah, I totally so agree with I you. Uh, I think you know a lot, Vasant. Obviously, you're asking very informed questions. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I do think it's a generational thing. I think that younger people tend to be much more open to technology in their food than older people do. And it's what we need to do. Like, there's no getting around it. If we want to continue eating meat in the type of quantities that we do today, which most people seem to want to do, then we have to find ways to produce meat without animals. And so I, I do think there are some people who want what they perceive as like the so-called real thing. Um, but I also think that if a product tastes good and is cost competitive, there'll be a lot of people, not everybody, but there'll be a lot of people who would be quite happy to eat it. You know, one of the uh, things I was reminded of when you were talking about chickens was... Uh... In my conversation with Domenica, I learned that chickens are highly social creatures. You know, she talked about the fact that roosters lie a lot and they, you know, and then hens discuss it among themselves and say, oh, that rooster lies a lot. You know, so uh, I learned a lot about animal psychology from that session, which is kind of interesting. 
pretty much any time that we think about the mental lives of other animals, we underestimate them. This is especially yeah. true when we're talking about the lives, the mental lives of the animals who we eat. It's very cognitive dissonance inducing to contemplate the fact that the animals who we eat are very smart animals, and that includes chickens. And so I just think the more we learn about them, though, the harder it becomes to uh, justify our treatment about them because we know that they are far, far more mentally interesting than we might have given them credit for in the past. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there's this uh, great documentary about an octopus. I, I think it's called My Octopus Friend or something. Just yeah. amazing how intelligent, sentient, you know, they are. So, you know, next time you chomp on the calamari, uh, or, or next time I do, I would wonder about something like that. So coming back to innovation and these various sort of S-curves and actors, you know, you talk about, you know, that people go through these ignore, laugh, fight phases, right? That initially they said, oh, let's just ignore it. And then they make fun of it. And, you know, this seems to be common in you know, the history of innovation where incumbents are resistant to new things. But it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the big meat manufacturers and processors seem to have capitulated that they seem to see the writing on the wall. Is that how you see it? Um, I, I, I don't know if I would say that they have, quote, capitulated. What I do think is that they recognize that the future of protein is going to be a lot more diverse than the past of protein. In the past, protein was really synonymous with flesh from a slaughtered animal's body. In the future, protein is going to also mean coming from plants, coming from animals, coming from microbes, and uh, coming from microbes, coming from fungi, and so on. And so you know, there is just going to be a different type of way to produce meat in the future than there is today. And so if you think about, for example, Kodak and Canon, they were vying for supremacy in the film market in the 1990s, and they both knew about digital. But it was Kodak that suppressed it because they were afraid it was going to cannibalize its core business of, you know, selling the paper for the photos and the darkroom chemicals and so on. But Canon said, hey, even if this does cannibalize our core business, we think it's the future, so we're going to invest. And we all know what happened. Kodak went bankrupt and Canon is now a major manufacturer of digital cameras. And there are a lot of meat companies that see this story and they want to be the Canon. They don't want to be the Kodak. And so for them, if they can continue producing cost-effective protein for their customers, even if it doesn't come from raising and slaughtering animals, I think that they would be quite happy to do so. And so there are some meat companies that I really do think are more like Kodak, and there are others that I think are more like Canon. But the forward-thinking meat companies recognize that we don't farm the way that we did 100 years ago today. And 100 years from now, we will not be farming the way that we do today. And so innovation is going to continue, and they need to get with the times. You know, I'm reminded of this framework that is often used in business schools by um, uh, Clay Christensen called the Innovator's Dilemma, right? And it describes how powerful incumbents sort of ignore these upstart technologies because no one wants them, yeah. you know, uh, you know, because they're listening to their customers and they serve their customers and they sort of ignore this upstart until it actually overtakes them. And by that time, it's too late. On the other hand, I, I can't but help wonder whether people have are now more aware of this phenomenon and therefore take steps to not fall into that trap mm -hmm. that Clay Christensen talked about. I, I think you've sort of touched on this already a little bit, but say a little bit more. Uh, do you see this phenomenon in the this alternative meat space as well. You, know, you talk about some being more like Canon, some being more like Kodak. So the ones that are like uh, Kodak, uh, are they in the majority or the minority? Uh, I do think it's in the majority now. So a few years ago, this wasn't the case, but uh, some of the biggest companies in the industry like Cargill and Tyson and Purdue and others have uh, really made uh, movement into this area. And that, I think, has uh, given the license to others to get involved. And so whether it's by having their own plant-based meat or by doing hybridized meat or uh, investing in cultivated meat companies, uh, I do think that most of the big meat companies now have at least their toe, if not their whole foot, into the animal-free waters. Interesting. What does regulation look like in this space? 
Uh, well, it's varied country by country, but in the U.S., plant-based meat is doing just fine. A number of states have tried to curtail plant-based meat by trying to censor them and making them uh, not use terms like burgers and hot dogs and so on and, unless they have beef in them. Um, but those laws have, by and large, been ruled unconstitutional. And so those are now, uh, you know, plant-based meat companies still, these companies are doing well in this regard. Um, with animal cell cultured meat, though, or cultivated meat or clean meat, this is still not legal to sell in the United States. Um, you know, even if you had a big factory, you couldn't sell it. And so uh, the companies in the space are hopeful that in the near future, the FDA and USDA will give them permission to start selling. Um, and hopefully uh, that will happen. Well, what do you think that's going to take? Well, you know, evidence of safety, first of all, so that I think is going to be the key thing. These agencies are science based and so they're going to rely so on experiments on animals. Um, I mean, that might be the case. I don't know. I don't know if that'll be necessary, but certain, I mean, you, know, you can do all types of in vitro testing to see human digestibility without testing on animals. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can test for safety that uh could hopefully satiate the regulators at FDA and, and USDA. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, Paul, uh, you know, how close are we to Star Trek when it comes to, you know, the future of food? Um, and I ask this because, you know, your book opens with, you know, you, you, you go to, you know, I don't know, it sounded like Grand Army Plaza and Modern Meadow, and you, you had a, uh, you bit into some steak chips, right? Which is <laughs> yeah. a totally new product. Right? And so, you know, as I was reading your book, I, you know, I, I couldn't help but think that this isn't just about substitution of existing products like meat and leather, you know, with new kinds of meat. It just seems to be like a whole brave new world of Star trek kind of possibilities, right? Where you can start synthesizing all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, it's like the genie's out of the bottle here, isn't it? Uh, well, let's hope so. Uh, we need to find better ways to produce more food with fewer resources, and we're not going to be able to do that by going back to 19th century methods of farming. We need to move on to 21st century methods of farming, and that's going to include a lot of indoor controlled agriculture like what we are talking about here. And so I like to envision a world in which maybe you'll have not just foods that mimic the meat experience, but actually exceed it. And so imagine, for example, of a scientist today, for example, you might have a bread maker or an ice cream maker on your kitchen counter. Well, what if you could have your own meat maker on the counter and you had little tea bags full of spores that you could drop in and come back a few hours later to get freshly brewed meat? Or what if you go to your local restaurant and in addition to brewing their own IPA in the back, what if they're brewing their own artisanal local um, meat for your dinner that very evening? Or even more, what if we are ever going to learn how to depart from our pale blue dot and start exploring the cosmos, you can rest assured that if we are going to engage in cosmic tourism, we are not going to be carrying Noah's Ark in tow. Rather, we are going to have to grow meat. Like if long distance astronauts want to consume meat, they're gonna to have to grow it. And so I believe that these types of technologies that we've been talking about today can open up entirely novel experiences for us that nobody before has ever enjoyed. Fascinating stuff, uh, Paul. I, I wish I uh, am around to see uh, uh, some of it, but it just it just sounds fascinating. I mean, there's, there's you know there's so many things that happened that have, that have happened in my lifetime that I'm amazed by, but I never would have imagined yeah. something like this being possible, right? That that you're talking well, about, just mind yeah, boggling. I mean, many of the technologies that we have today are far beyond what like the Greek gods ever could have accomplished, right? So like you think about the abilities of Greek gods, uh, you know, like they never were having video conferencing live with one another, you know, like they had to travel to go places like, I mean, you know, you and I are able to talk video to video right now live with each other. Uh, these are technologies yeah. that, you know, are truly divine in their nature almost. And so... Um, I, I see a future, uh, presuming that we can get over this hump of climate change, which you know, threatens our, our whole civilization. But if we can um, you know, get beyond the threats that are existential to us, like climate change and nuclear war and so on, I see uh, quite a bright future for our species. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, it would be pretty amazing to 
tell the machine, you know, make me a Romulan mushroom pie. You know, uh, or if you're, yeah. uh, you know, or, or Romulan steak, if you're inclined in that direction. Um, I can't, I can't wait for that day. I really hope to, <laughs> I, I too, I too hope to live that long. So Paul, uh, what's your advice to young people who want to get into the space? And I asked this, you know, because yesterday, uh, you know, someone called me, uh, uh, you know, someone who's just graduated from school, daughter of a relative of mine. And, you know, we were just discussing, you know, interesting areas to be in. And, you know, I just said, you know, it's always good to be on the ground floor of something, you know, whatever it is, you know, just, you know, pick a pick a growth area and be, you know, we're, you know, talking about various areas and, and food came up and, you know, not surprisingly, because it was top of mind, given our conversation this uh, morning. But what would your advice be to people who really want to sort of get into this space? How, how should they think about a career in this sort of alternative food space? One of the errors that I see frequently is that people think if they want to be involved in this space that they need to have some advanced technological capacities, right? They need a PhD in microbiology or food science or biochemistry, or et cetera. And those are extremely useful. You know, we need those people. But we need lots of people in this space. We need people with MBAs. We need people who are HR professionals and accountants and video designers and marketing people. Uh, so my advice really is that you should think about what you are good at and enjoy, and then apply that to go work at one of these companies or start your own company for that matter. So there's a lot of room for more companies in the space. You can start your own. But if you don't want to do that, it's a very taxing thing to do, I can assure you. But if you want, you can do really good things uh, at current companies. And so if you are, let's say, really, you know, you are really love accounting, Great. These companies need accountants. Let's let's bring it on. Become an accountant at one of the alternative protein companies. Are you hiring? The Better Meat Co. is hiring. So if you go to our website, bettermeat.co, again, that's bettermeat.co, you can see positions for which we are hiring. And um, if you're interested in reading my book, Clean Meat, you can go get it at anywhere books are sold, including Amazon. Uh, but the book's official website is cleanmeat.com. Awesome. Paul. Fascinating conversation. You know, I learned a lot uh, reading your book and I highly recommend it to people. So thanks again for being on the show. Really enjoyed it. Vasant, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for all you're doing. And it's really a pleasure to talk with you.